On the evening of the 2nd of June 2010, Sharon and Kevin Rossington said goodnight to their youngest son, 21-year-old Sean. Be safe, keep out trouble. Mum had down gone to bed and left Sean on the computer. Quite a normal evening, really, for them. But when the couple woke up the next morning, their son's bed had not been slept in. Sean had left the house during the night. I just can't understand why he went out because he was scared of the dark. He slept with the light on. It's totally out of character for Sean to go out. Something or someone had tempted Sean out into the darkness. Sean had been lured out of the house that night, but we didn't know why. We didn't know where he was going, and we didn't know who he was going to meet. Sean's decision to venture into the night resulted in a catastrophic crime. I don't think any of us can really begin to imagine the, the horror that he would have faced. Ambulance, please. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Lincoln, the picturesque historic city in the Midlands dominated by its beautiful cathedral. In one of its leafy suburbs, Sharon and Kevin Rossington started their family. First came Chris, and then two and a half years later, their youngest son, Sean, was born in 1988. He was a happy-go-lucky child. He loved cars, he loved garages, and um, learning to ride a bike. When Sean was just a toddler, like many other children, he developed chickenpox but Sean responded to the illness badly. His temperature escalated and he had a fit. I remember picking him up out of his cot bed and he was really like limp and you know, a bit frothing at the mouth and his eyes rolling slightly. I can remember jumping across the top of the landing to the bathroom to cool him down because he was really on fire. Sean's parents believe the fit he suffered at the age of two and a half affected his mental development. He was very subdued and yeah, very different and you know, not his usual self at all. He was diagnosed then as having moderate learning difficulties with autism traits. He used to say, Mum, I, I don't know, I can't understand how to do this. He didn't like it very much. He was totally aware that people did things different to him sometimes. Physically, Sean was advanced and when he became a teenager, he grew very tall. As he developed into 14, 15, he just shot up. <laughs> we used to say to him, it's like you've been put in a grow bag and you've just flourished and grown into this big tree. You know, you're so tall. Sean became known as the gentle giant. But although he now looked yeah. like a man, <laughs> in many ways, even as he grew older, he remained a child. I know it's strange to look at somebody of his stature and think, there's a big guy, he can't be afraid of the dog. But he didn't like it. Hi, Hi Doctor. Sharon. Hi. Lovely to see you. Okay, take a seat. At the age of 17, Sean met with a psychiatrist about his learning difficulties. The psychiatrist's report stated Sean was a vulnerable and gullible young man. Three years later, in 2009, he received an additional diagnosis and Sean is suffering from Asperger's syndrome. As well as concluding that Sean had Asperger's syndrome, the psychiatrist reported that he was naive and found it difficult to interact, both socially and emotionally. I'd be very worried about him um, because I knew how uh, gullible and naive he was. And I was always trying to keep an eye out to make sure that people weren't taking advantage of him because he was quite easily led. It's much better, eh? Cheers, mate. If Cheers. someone was to say to him, oh, because you're 21, Sean, and they were younger, well, you know, for example, will you go in this shop and purchase some alcohol for us? He probably would do that for them as well because he wouldn't see the consequences of his actions. He wanted to be like other people, and I think he would make stories up like, you know, probably that he had a job. Well, you got a job, where's that? Yeah, it, it's a, a shop down the road. 
I think sometimes if people would say, can you lend me some money, he'd probably say, well, I can when I get paid, but, you know, obviously we knew he didn't have a job. In 2009, Sean met someone who accepted him for who he really was. He started a relationship with a 19-year-old girl who lived in Lincoln. He made him feel more normal, like his friends, but he tended to be quite happy, you know, to tell people he'd got a girlfriend. We were always happy that, you know, Sean began to grow up a little bit, basically, and have a little bit more independence. And Sean seemed to be finding his feet. He loved football and in 2010 had started going to the gym with a neighbour. We used to shout out his bedroom window, actually, to his friend who lives next door but one. Are you going to the gym tonight, Lee? He used to say, you know, and he'll say, yeah, Sean, buddy, come round. And he, he said, all right, mate, I'll be round. So, but, he, you know, he looked forward to stuff like that, he did. Sean, keep going. Nice and deep. And up. And he was quite fit, really, to say he smoked. <laughs> Hi, son. Hi. On the evening of the 2nd of June 2010, Sean went to the gym as usual before heading home and spending time with his mum and dad. It was just really like a, an average Wednesday evening for us. I can remember my husband coming to bed and him saying oh, to Sean, be good, be keep safety. out of trouble, see you tomorrow. The Rossington family could never have imagined that less than 24 hours later, their world would be torn apart and changed forever. I'll see you tomorrow, love. You know. On the evening of the 2nd of June 2010, as Sharon and Kevin Rossington headed upstairs to bed, they left their youngest son, Sean, playing on his computer. Oh, Sean, be safe, keep out of trouble. Good night. 21-year-old Sean suffered from learning difficulties and had been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome the year before. But the next morning, when Sharon went to Sean's room... Sean, love, you're awake. I need a cup of tea. There was no sign of him. I discovered Sean's bed had not been slept in. What we initially thought, he'd gone next door but one to his friends and stayed there for the night. Just in the back of my mind, thinking that we'll hear from him soon, he'll ring up. Sean's mum and dad suspected he had gone to see a neighbour late at night and fallen asleep at their house, which is something he had done a couple of times before. As soon as I hear something, I'll give you a call. Promise me what you can do, Sean. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. Throughout the morning, there was no word from Sean. In the back of my mind, whilst I was at work all that morning, I was, you know, I must, when I get my break, ring him and see if he's all right. But at 1 p.m., before Sharon had been able to start trying to track down her son, someone arrived to see her at work. I just looked up and, hello, are you Sharon Rossington? Can we speak with you? And I'm, like, thinking, are you going to tell me something bad? It was family liaison officer Diane Squires from Lincoln Police. She was initially shocked, couldn't understand what we were saying and then completely distraught. I had to listen to it that many times to even make sense of, it, you know, what they were telling me. I just couldn't believe it. A body had been discovered in the early hours of the 3rd of June, 2010. What's that? Someone on the grass over there. Ambulance, please. I think we've just found a dead body. Initial investigations led the police to believe they'd found Sharon's son, Sean. There's blood everywhere. A 999 call was made at seven minutes past four that morning by a 16-year-old female telling the ambulance staff that she had come across the body of a male. Jackie's pulse. It's really cold. He was laying face down on the grassed area in a field just outside of Lincoln. We're near, like, the junction. Yeah, hurry up, please, I don't know what to do. The ambulance arrived at the field and found the young female who had made the telephone call, along with three friends. They examined the body of the male on the ground and pronounced him dead at 4.15 hours that morning. The police attended shortly after the arrival of the ambulance staff and secured the scene 
and took the details of the four friends who were present. And they told them to return to the home address so they could visit them at a later date with a view to taking witness statements from them. Those four friends were potentially very important witnesses to the investigation. Okay, thank you. At first, it had proved difficult to identify the body. There was no wallet, no mobile phone, no house keys. The only thing there was was a gym fob with a number on it. Of course, inquiries could be made later with a gym, but at 4 o'clock in the morning, the gym was closed. Sean was a physically fit and healthy young man, but the police could immediately see he had suffered violent injuries. And there appeared to be a clue explaining how the 21-year-old had sustained those injuries. One of the first things that the attending officers noticed um, about Sean was that he didn't have any trainers on, so he was sock feet only and no, no trainers even in the close proximity to him. Trainers that were assumed to be Sean's were found near the junction of Serbia Road and Nettleham Road. Whilst the officers were cordoning off this very large area of, uh, of roadway, they, they noticed a pair of white trainers in that junction. This led the police to consider how Sean had died. We had a number of theories, one of which was, was this a road traffic accident? <laughs> Was that why the trainers were, were in that junction? Or some other unexplained death? At that early stage, he laid face down. He hadn't been closely examined. The priorities were to secure and preserve the scene so that everything could be considered. Whether a hit and run or not, it was clear a serious crime had happened. While the scenes of crime officers worked tirelessly, the police went to speak to the four young people who had raised the alarm by calling 999. Officers visited the flat just before 5am that morning. Did you recognise him? No. Hmm. The four persons present at the time of the 999 call were a 16-year-old girl, a 13-year-old girl, a 16-year-old male and a male of 20. There was a young 16-year-old male also at the address at the time. The, the flat was tenanted by a, a man called Nicholas Shelbourne, and it became apparent that the other males certainly were either living there or had been using it as a base to reside over the, the previous few days. The four friends who'd made the 999 call seemed to be the first people to find Sean's body, and so were vital to the investigation. And so standard practice would be um, to speak to them in some detail, um, to seize their clothing because they'd been in contact with Sean at that early stage. And in order to do that with some degree of control, um, they were invited to come to Lincoln Police Station. While the young group were preparing to set off to the police station, two more people arrived at the flat. About 10 minutes after the officers arrived, uh, two other people came to the flat. Um, one was the occupant, Nicholas Shelbourne, who was 26 at the time, and the other was 16-year-old Daryl Jones, who was living with, with Shelbourne. They'd returned to the flat and said they'd been to a, a nearby phone box to make a call. The four witnesses, their 16-year-old friend and the two who'd just returned to the flat, were all invited down to the police station. All seven were initially asked to come to Lincoln Police Station, and the reason being, um, obviously, you've got four of them who'd, who'd been in contact with, with Sean, um, and then at that stage it wasn't... Uh, immediately clear whether the other three had been in what level of contact they'd been in with the four. So again, making sure that we cover all our bases when we're looking at forensic evidence. Um, they were all asked to come down so that the, the forensic evidence on their clothing and on their person could be secured properly. At the police station, officers talked to each of the seven witnesses, including the four who claimed to have found Sean when he was already dead. Their statements were all very similar. They all said they'd been at Nick's flat uh, the previous evening. Uh, I got back home about 8 o'clock. I had a few people at my flat, but that's, that's usually the way anyway. I've got a few people staying there. Nick decided that he actually wanted a pizza around 11. None of us had credit on our phones. We got to the phone box and that was broken, so we came back. At about 4 o'clock in the morning, Mark Jackson, um, who was 20, and Jordan O'Rourke, who was 16, uh, they'd left with the 16-year-old girl and the 13-year-old girl. I realised I had to get some clothes from my friend's house. Yeah, Baby, what's I up? need to pick some clothes. Well, I won't with you. Uh, See you a bit, mate. Yeah, we were just walking down the road and we cut across over the grass verge 
where we found him. Someone on the grass over there. And uh, we actually stumbled upon the body. Uh, I lifted the victim's head and realised that he was bleeding and covered in bruises. I think he's dead. And then um, my friend rang an ambulance, and then but we knew he was dead. I think we've just found a dead body. All four told us that they'd never seen him before, but they waited with him whilst the ambulance arrived before returning to Nicholas Shelbourne's flat. And the four of them came home, and she was crying, and she said she'd found a body. So they rang the police. They were all shook up on that. I mean, when they said that at first, I thought it was joking. Are you joking? Oh, no, man, are being serious? As well as talking through what happened to them that night, the seven also gave the police their clothes to be forensically tested. It was established that obviously four of them had been in contact or very close proximity to the body of Sean, and then obviously they'd been back to a flat where the other three were, so standard practice in a case like that would be to, to seize the clothing. Um, that way we secure and preserve any forensic evidence that, uh, that's possible from, from all seven of them. Having helped the police, the seven friends left the station. They appeared to be the only people who knew anything about Sean Rossington's mysterious death. But later that day, another witness contacted the police with new information. A local 40-year-old male came forward to tell police that that morning he had in fact walked across the field and had come across the body of a male laying in the grass who he claims at that time was still alive and breathing. This male, in fact, tried to rouse the person he had found on the grass. You all right there, mate? And considered that he was just drunk or under the influence of drugs and continued on his way to see some friends. It seemed the witness had discovered Sean just after 2 a.m., two hours before he was found dead by the four young friends who called 999. He returned about half an hour later and the male was still laying on the grass and he tried to rouse him again, but was unsuccessful, so left him and carried on his way home. No one knew how Sean came to be on that field and what happened to him there. Sean was identified through his gym fob and nine hours after his body was discovered, Sharon Rossington was being given the tragic news that every parent dreads. You're questioning you know, yourself and thinking, well, why? You know, what, how? You know, how could it have been, Sean? You know, you're mistaken, it's somebody else. The Rossington family were only at the beginning of their nightmare. We were quite confident that the male was Sean Rossington, but we still had to follow procedure and have him formally identified by his parents. So I took Sharon and Kevin to the local hospital so they could do that. But he just what didn't look like the Sean we remember. It's just awful. I don't think I'll ever forget what I saw, you know, on my son. Yeah, to the day I die, it's awful. But whilst they grieved for their loss, the Rossingtons were also stunned and confused that their youngest son had willingly left his home in the dead of night, especially as he was afraid of the dark. Lots of questions we asked ourselves. We wanted to know, how did he get there? Did he go in someone's car? Did he walk? We didn't know whether he had had a drink, because he wasn't a big drinker. Alcohol didn't agree with him, so we thought maybe he's gone out and had a drink with some friends and he's drank a little too much and his phone hurt his head or then we heard about this the shoes being on the floor and maybe he thought he'd been hit by a car and he's injured or we just thought he might have been just uh, randomly attacked but although the family still had lots of questions piece by piece the police were developing a picture of what happened that night from talking to his family we know that his parents went to bed at about quarter past 11 the evening before and they'd left Sean playing on his laptop downstairs in the lounge. Be safe, keep out of trouble. Yeah, Good night. We know that Sean left home after his parents had gone to bed at quarter past 11 and the witness told us that he had stumbled across him after two o'clock that morning when he'd considered him to be a drunk lion in the field. Though the time scale had now been reduced quite considerably. 
The route from Sean's home address to the field where he's found is about 30 to 35 minutes long, even for a tall young man like Sean walking briskly. There are only a number of routes he could have taken to the scene, and so we started to consider the possibilities of CCTV coverage in the area to see if we could see he'd, if he'd been captured. But there was still one central mystery. Why had Sean voluntarily left his home in the middle of the night? This was unusual. For him to be going out at that time of day, um, it would have had to have been going out somewhere that he knew or to meet someone he knew. And from what we could understand, was something that Sean wouldn't have done lightly. It did appear to the investigation that Sean must have gone out to meet somebody that night. And it was important to us to try and identify who that person was. We needed to speak to them urgently to see if they could assist us in, in recounting the story of Sean's journey that evening. The police believed the answer to the mystery may be hidden in Sean's computer. We took his laptop because we knew from his mum and dad that he'd been on the computer that day. We were looking to see who he'd been interacting with, if he'd exchanged any emails or social media contact with anybody, made any plans, and probably going a bit further back to see if, in fact, he'd been in contact with anybody that we weren't aware of from talking to his family and close friends. They also wanted to examine his mobile phone, but it was nowhere to be found. Sean's phone wasn't on him. It wasn't near his body. It was missing, and as a matter of importance, we needed to find it. And the plan was to get uh, his phone data, his phone records, to, to work out who he'd been in contact with uh, during the preceding few hours. While the mobile phone records were sourced, the police turned their attention to how Sean had died. Sean had suffered injuries to his face and upper body, and at the time, it was difficult to ascertain how those injuries had occurred. Had he been hit in a hit and run accident or whether or not he'd been viciously assaulted. The results of the post mortem clarified the cause of Sean's death. After the pathology results came in, it was apparent that this wasn't an accident, that, that Sean had died as a, as a result of sustaining a, a significant violent physical beating. Sean's trainers had been found in the road, which had led the police to believe he had been killed by a car. However, if Sean was not the victim of a hit and run, why were his trainers found so far away from his body? Yeah, the trainers then became, became interesting when we established that this wasn't likely to be a hit and run. Why, why were the trainers there? Had they been put there to make it look like it was a hit and run? Or was that where Sean was assaulted and, and for some reason we couldn't understand it had his trainers taken off? Could whoever had removed the trainers be responsible for killing Sean? It was clear at this stage then that Sean had been, had been attacked. Um, he'd been violently assaulted. Um, this wasn't an accident. We were investigating a, a murder. Is that someone on the grass over there? In the early hours of the 3rd of June 2010, Sean Rossington's body was found on a field in Lincoln. At first, police thought Sean had been hit by a car because his trainers were found in the road. But the autopsy revealed the 21-year-old who suffered from learning difficulties had been brutally beaten to death. This was a violent and, we would say, a prolonged attack on Sean. And whoever had done this to him had really meant to hurt him. Uh, he'd sustained dozens of injuries, kicks, punches. Uh, he'd been stamped on. He'd been hit on the head by an inanimate object. The information that... Sean had been murdered. It was absolutely a nightmare. It was horrible. To be in that situation, I think he would have been ter absolutely terrified. Um, he wouldn't have known what to do. He wouldn't have put up a fight at all. He, he just would have surrendered, basically. Now I can imagine him begging for his life, to be honest. He wouldn't understand what was happening to him. The post-mortem also revealed Sean had not died immediately after the attack and his life may have been saved if only an ambulance had been called earlier. Sean ultimately died of asphyxiation. We believe that Sean fell unconscious. The position he found himself in meant that his arm blocked his airways and effectively Sean suffocated to death. But obviously all that was caused by the, the assault. After severely beating Sean, those behind the attack were only concerned with one thing, trying to cover their tracks. We believe that Sean had been wearing his trainers at the time of the assault 
and that the offender had removed them and thrown them into the middle of the road in order to make it look like Sean had been the victim of a hit and run accident. This action implied that whoever assaulted Sean had known that they had killed him and had thrown the trainers into the road in order to hide that fact. But the central mystery still remained unresolved. Why had Sean left the safety of his home in the middle of the night to meet someone who had then killed him? House to house inquiries revealed a number of witnesses who had in fact been woken up during the early hours of that morning by males shouting and the sound of running. And we were able to establish that Sean had probably been attacked around about two o'clock that morning. We were being told that witnesses had, had heard comments like, run, keep your head down. One witness told us how he got up in the early hours of that morning at about quarter past two to go to the bathroom. He'd seen a shadowy group of individuals running away. He'd heard shouting something similar to, leave me alone. And he had stood and watched them until they disappeared out of view. Who were the shadowy figures? Had they attacked and killed Sean? And why had the 21-year-old left his home in the early hours and walked 35 minutes to a remote junction in Lincoln? Sean's mobile phone records explained more than the police could ever have imagined. We'd been unable to locate Sean Washington's mobile phone, but we had been able to access his mobile phone records. All right, then, I'll see you in a bit. Bye. And once we started to look at those, they changed the face of the investigation forever. Detectives discovered that in the hour leading up to his attack at around 2am, Sean was using his mobile. It rapidly became apparent to us that um, the phone had been used during the course of the evening um, between 1.05 uh, a.m. and 1.42. That morning, there were a series of texts and phone calls, nine texts in total and three um, voice telephone calls, the last one of those being at uh, 1.42, and that call lasted three minutes, nearly three minutes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm on my way, yeah. Sean had spoken to someone on the telephone just 15 minutes before he was attacked. The question was, who was he talking to? These texts and calls were all to the same number. There, were, there was no other interaction between Sean's phone and, and any other phone um, in that sort of time parameter. Um, and that certainly led us to believe that whoever was on that phone or using that phone was the person that Sean was arranging to meet. The answer was in the 11-digit phone number he had been speaking to, and that mobile phone number was all too familiar to the police. Ambulance, please. I think we've just found a dead body. It was the same mobile number that dialed 999, claiming to have stumbled across a body laid face down on the grass. The phone number that Sean had been texting and dialing was in fact the same number belonging to the 16-year-old female who two hours later had phoned the ambulance and who had claimed to have stumbled across the body of Sean Washington. The 16-year-old girl who up until that point had been, to all intents and purposes, a, a helpful witness, that clearly was a lie. So all of a sudden, all seven of those people who had been witnesses were suddenly being considered in a whole new light. The 16-year-old girl and her six friends had all denied knowing Sean. The seven had clearly lied to the police. Did you recognise him? Which begged the question, if they lied about knowing Sean, what else had they lied about? I oh, uh, just went out to make the phone call, got no credit on the phone. They'd said to us that he'd been at Nicholas's flat all evening and then they'd gone out. They'd unsuccessfully gone looking for food and, and come straight home again. Well, what time was that? We began to ask exactly where they'd been, what time they'd been out, why, when the police were, were at Nicholas's flat, did the other two come back? Where had they been? Um, had they, in fact, been out to make a phone call? Or had they been out to hide some evidence? Were we going to find them on CCTV near the junction where the trainers were found? Um, everything, everything that they'd said was now, you know, under, under the microscope was being questioned. Convinced their story held a darker secret, the seven friends were arrested on suspicion of Sean Rossington's murder. That was all seven, right through from 26-year-old Nicholas Shelbourne through to the 13-year-old female. Nicholas Shelbourne was a 26-year-old male living in a one-bedroomed flat in Lincoln. He was unemployed. He appeared to be very immature for his age and certainly came across as having difficulties socialising with people of his own age. 
Mark Jackson was a 20-year-old male, unemployed and had come from a broken home. He presented himself as a very immature young man for his age. I'm Jordan O'Rourke, 16 years of age, um, very little in the way of, of previous convictions. Quietly spoken, um, on the face of it, um, quite an intelligent young man. Daryl Jones was a 16-year-old male with a troubled background. His parents had divorced when he was a child and he'd been expelled from school. A young man with, with convictions for violence, um, significant convictions, you would, you would argue, for a, for a man of his age. The 16-year-old female had wanted to train as a nursery school teacher and had been described as being happy-go-lucky by family. The 13-year-old, um, lots of questions asked over why a 13-year-old was, was out at that time of the day anyway. Um, she had some interaction and involvement with, with other agencies. And then the 16-year-old male, again, no previous convictions, always portrayed as a quiet, fairly isolated individual, was living uh, with Nick Shelbourne at the time. Um, I think probably fair to say that he was sofa surfing. The 16-year-old boy and the two girls who were arrested can't be named for legal reasons. In custody, the seven were now suspects rather than witnesses. And as word got out about their arrest, a number of new witnesses stepped forward. Some of these people were in fact friends of some of those that were arrested. There was one witness in particular came forward. He'd been in the Lincoln Central Library just after midday on the 3rd, so not long after, after this group had left the police station, having been in as, as witnesses on, on that morning. But he'd seen Nicholas Shelbourne, Mark Jackson and the 16-year-old girl. Um, he knew them vaguely. Uh, he then saw Daryl Jones talking to Shelbourne. He heard a sort of raised voice, if you like, interaction at Nicholas Shelbourne saying, if, if she doesn't keep her gob shut, Everybody will find out. The witness at the library was not the only person who approached the police with information. 16-year-old Daryl Jones's girlfriend also came forward. Two days earlier, she had received a text from her boyfriend. Prior to being seen by police, Jones had in fact sent a text message to his girlfriend saying, I could be getting done for murder. I love you, baby. This raised suspicions about Jones's involvement, because if he was an innocent man, then why would he have sent such a text? She obviously came forward with that information, and she'd also told us about other, other interactions that she'd had with him. Friends of hers had come forward um, to tell us things that they'd overheard him saying to his girlfriend. Dad Jones had, had told them that it was O'Rourke who'd started it, but it was in fact himself, Daryl Jones, who'd finished it. He talked about once he'd started, he couldn't stop, uh, which gave us a lot of insight into Jones's character. But the witnesses weren't just claiming the suspects had confessed to attacking Sean. They also revealed the gang had described to them the great lengths they had gone to to cover up their crime. It would appear from what the witnesses were telling us that these guys were making admissions to having bleached their shoes, um, to disposing of clothing to hiding bits of evidence from, from the police. You know, right from fairly early on in this investigation, the gloves were off as far as witnesses were concerned. People were quite happy to come and talk to the police. Despite the damning witness accounts, the police were still hearing the same version of events they were told immediately after Sean's body was discovered. During their initial police interviews, uh, Nicholas Shelbourne uh, stuck to the version of events that he'd given to the police. Like I said, we decided we wanted pizza. None of us had any credit on our phone, so we couldn't phone from the flat. We decided to go for a walk to the phone box. We arrived at the phone box and it was broke. It was out of order, so we couldn't order the pizza. So then we wandered back to the flat. Um, in his witness statement, um, he said that the four others had gone out to fetch some clothing from the 16-year-old girl's house, that the group of four had returned and, and told him they'd found a body, and, and he continued to maintain how shocked and surprised he was about, uh, about that. Mark Jackson, again, stuck to that version of events. And where were you at this time? In the flat, having a few beers. The 16-year-old female uh, who made the 999 call equally. She stuck to the, the version that the group had, had come up with. I might have touched the body when I first ran over. Daryl Jones and Jordan O'Rourke uh, made no comment interviews throughout uh, their initial interviews with the police. No, 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 no. It seemed the Gang of Seven had concocted a version of events of that evening and made a pact to stick to it. However, not all of them, it seemed, were keeping to the agreement. 
the 16-year-old boy and 13-year-old girl decided to tell the police what had really happened the night Sean was murdered. Nick told us, you've got to lie to them a little bit, because if we tell the truth, we'll all end up getting done. Uh, the fact that the 16-year-old boy and the 13-year-old girl were actually going to tell us a different version of events was a breakthrough for us. But equally, it was, it was a bit of a surprise that, um, that they had the, uh, the wherewithal, if you like, to, to come out of the control of the rest of the group. And when the 16-year-old boy started to talk, he presented a disturbingly different version of events to the police. He talked about going out with the group, knowing that they were intending to meet somebody. They were planning to give him a beating. He talks about going onto the field, whereupon he saw Jordan O'Rourke uh, lift a bottle and strike Sean. And he talks about seeing the others attacking Sean. And then as soon as he fell to the ground, I ran. The 13-year-old girl also told a very similar account. And before long, the other suspects began to change their stories. You know, people began to turn on one another um, more and more as the, as the interview process went on. They were all beating hell out of some bloke on the floor. No idea who it was. Shelbourne maintained that he played no part in the actual violence. I, I went running over, like, trying to sort of help him. I picked him up. I got him got him part way up, I think. And that he ran over and pulled Daryl Jones away. Jones broke free and went back to attack Sean further. Look, I've told you I wasn't down there. the river. Oh, my Do God. All right, all right. I went with him down to the field, OK? Mark Jackson changed his account throughout the course of the interview. All I did was kick him in the leg. I asked him to stop, OK? And O'Rourke had said that he was not responsible for any violence. No, I was standing back. I tried to pull the guy off him. But there was one person in particular the group turned upon. Daryl's a bit of a nutter. Uh, he's got a court case for GBH and stuff going on at the moment. I've been there when he's fighting. I know what he's like. It's fair to say that Daryl Jones was named by most of the group as the main protagonist, the, the instigator of the violence. He was either named um, as a specific individual by, by some, or in the case of others, uh, it was inferred that it was him. Despite now being the prime suspect, Daryl Jones continued to answer no comment to every question the police asked him. No! Comment. Including questions about the central mystery in the murder case. We believe that Sean had been lured out of the house that night, but we didn't know why. How had the gentle giant been coaxed out of the safety of his home and into the dead of night? In the early hours of the 3rd of June 2010, the body of a young man had been discovered. It was that of Sean Rossington, a 21-year-old who had learning difficulties and Asperger's syndrome. Two days later, the police arrested seven young people who had presented themselves as innocent bystanders. 26-year-old Nick Shelbourne, 20-year-old Mark Jackson, 16-year-olds Daryl Jones and Jordan O'Rourke, along with another 16-year-old boy, a 16-year-old girl and a 13-year-old girl, were being questioned. By now, they had turned on one another, blaming each other for the violence and lies that unfolded that night. Daryl Jones hit him with a bottle. Daryl's a bit of a nutter. He was just going crazy, just, he wouldn't stop. The reason for Sean leaving his home and his connection to the seven suspects had been a complete mystery. But then, the link emerged. Examination of Sean Rossington's Facebook account revealed that he, in fact, had had some contact with a 13-year-old female through Facebook over a period of time, and they were, in fact, friends. It also emerged that the 13-year-old he believed to be his friend and the 16-year-old girl had started texting him a few hours before he was murdered. Sean Rossington was a very naive and young 21-year-old. He was very impressionable and it appeared to the police investigation that the communications during that evening with the 13-year-old female were what encouraged him to go out in the early hours of that Wednesday morning. The fact that Sean had left his home after dark to meet up with his friend was being used by the murder suspects as their justification for brutally killing the autistic 21-year-old. 
All seven of those arrested claimed that the reason Sean Rossington had left home that morning and gone to meet them was so that he could have sexual favours with a 13-year-old female. And they claimed this was their reason for attacking him and ultimately killing him. There's no evidence in this investigation to suggest that, that Sean's relationship with the 13-year-old was, was inappropriate. Um, from what we know and understand about Sean, he perceived his, his friendship with the 13-year-old as just that, a friendship, and therefore for these individuals to try and justify their behaviour um, in any other fashion um, is just abhorrent, really. The claims that Sean had sexual desires towards the young teenager was a last-ditch attempt by the suspects to distract from the horrific crime they had committed. Without a doubt, it was an excuse. Um, I don't think they were sincere at all. I think they were, they were found out, they were caught, they were cornered, they knew what they'd done. Throughout, they've been disingenuous, they've concocted this story, this smokescreen, and not for one minute do I think they were sincere. Sean isn't a paedophile, and he never was. And, you know, they stick reasons for doing what they did. It was an excuse. Uh, there was a lot of excuses, uh, and that was the main one, really. But after a while, uh, it faded. Uh, it was shown to be a lie and an excuse. It was not the only lie the gang told to cover their tracks. They claimed they had left the flat to try and buy pizza around midnight on the evening of Sean's murder. The reality seemed to be that the seven initially arranged to meet Sean in a different location where they feared they had been caught on CCTV and needed to explain why they were there. The police believed the reason this location was chosen was because of a cash machine where the seven could force Sean to withdraw money for them. Sean's condition meant that he was often naive and unable to judge intent. And so when pressured that evening, he went out to see his friend. We would argue her friendship with Sean was used as a lure to, to get him out so they could at the very least get cash from him. Yeah, I'll meet you there. The gang believed that Sean was wealthy, but the reality was he was given a cash allowance of £10 each day by his father. If the seven were expecting money from Sean that night, they would have been seriously disappointed, even angry. All seven were charged with his murder, including the 13-year-old girl who cannot be identified for legal reasons. She was the youngest female to face such a charge since Mary Bell in 1968. The case came to trial on the 3rd of October 2010, four months after the murder had occurred. All seven pleaded not guilty to the murder of Sean Rossington. Even right to the bitter end, nobody took responsibility for what they'd done in that trial. Nobody was prepared to, act, to accept you know, the, the brutal horror of what they'd done to Sean. At the trial in autumn 2010, the prosecution presented the sequence of events police believe happened that night. After talking on Facebook, and texting into the early hours of the 3rd of June 2010, Sean Rossington went out to meet the 13-year-old girl. Sean got lost en route and changed the meeting location. Upon arrival at the field, Sean was ambushed. Jordan O'Rourke struck him with a bottle and he was punched, kicked and stamped on, sustaining over 40 injuries in a vicious and ultimately murderous assault. Daryl Jones placed Sean's shoes in the road to make it look like a hit and run. After the attack, the gang bleached their shoes and dumped their clothes, as well as concocting a cover story. At seven minutes past four in the morning, four of the gang returned to the scene and dialed 999. Yeah, hello, ambulance, please. On the 17th of December 2010, the verdicts were returned. The 16-year-old boy was found not guilty. The 13-year-old girl was found guilty of conspiracy to pervert the course of justice and sentenced to a two-year youth rehabilitation order. The 16-year-old girl was found guilty of manslaughter and conspiracy to pervert the course of justice and was sentenced to five years in a young offender institute. Nicholas Shelbourne was found guilty of murder and conspiracy to pervert the course of justice and sentenced to life imprisonment.
to serve a minimum of 13 years. Mark Jackson was also found guilty on both counts and given the same sentence. Daryl Jones was found guilty too and sentenced to a minimum term of 13 years. And Jordan O'Rourke was also found guilty of the murder of Sean Rossington and conspiracy to pervert the course of justice and sentenced to a minimum term of 11 years. People of that age um, to be involved in a plan of that nature uh, startles me. But moreover was the plan, the concocted plan, the story, their ability to, to portray themselves as sincere witnesses when in fact they knew all along you know, how involved they'd been. For me, I mean, that just smacks of utter contempt, really, for, for everything that, that Sean, Sean was. The memory of Sean Rossington, the gentle giant, will forever be held in his family's hearts. You know, often when we go and put flowers and tidy the headstone at the cemetery, you still can't believe. You know, when it comes to be his birthday and Christmas and family celebrations, he's not there with us in person, and it's just hard to accept. You know, we miss him so much. Just a huge void in our life now. Every day, I'll think about him. There'll always be something that reminds me of him, but now it doesn't upset me, it just makes me smile, which is uh, the way I want, that's what I want to do when I think of my brother.